Um, let's move on to the second presentation, which I'll be giving, obviously. I'll be talking about the FIU pedestrian bridge collapse in Florida. This was not an old bridge. It was brand new. It didn't have time to get assessed, basically, before it collapsed. Um, it's an interesting case study because there's a lot of information in the public domain, um, including initial reports from uh, two separate independent in investigations. So we do have quite a bit of information. So the content of the presentation, I'll start with the sources of information. Uh, we've got the project procurement and the, and the main participants, not all of them. I'll go into a bit of a description of the structure so you get a feel for the, for the, the scale of it. Um, then we'll go on to the sequence of events leading to the collapse and uh, we'll follow that with uh, a bit of a summary of all the investigations uh, to date and, uh, and, and the latest uh, information that's uh, come to light. So first of all, main sources of information, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation has been a goldmine of, uh, of the original source documents, which I've tried to keep to as much as possible to sort of minimize speculation. Um, they've, lost, they've, they've basically released a lot of contractual records, drawings, and calculations, so uh, a lot of information. Um, I also have uh, some reports from National Transportation Safety Board, um, and, I'll, and I'll describe their role a little bit uh, later. Uh, we have one report uh, hot off the press from the o Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, the, that report was dated 11th of June, and, uh, and I have to thank uh, Chris Hendy for bringing it to my, uh, uh, to my attention only two days ago. So that's uh, required a few hasty uh, amendments. Um, and the, uh, last but not least, uh, I have looked at a few uh, bits of news on uh, American TV and online outlets. I've tried not to rely on them too much. They're, they're not the most reliable outlets, but there's some interesting bits in there. Principal project participants, we've got the private client, uh, which is Florida International University, uh, the design and build contractor, Munilla Construction Management, uh, and their designer, FIG Bridge Engineers, which I'm sure many of you probably have heard of. Uh, then they have what is called the Construction Engineering and Inspection Contract, which is a contract administration come uh, site supervision role, and that was Bolton Perez and Associates. And the independent peer reviewer, which was Louis Berger Group, which is now part of WSP, I understand. So procurement, so the, the FIU uh, trustees, which is the, 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 actual, uh, the actual client, awarded the DMB contract in January 2016, uh, three and a half years ago now. It's a 12, about $12 million contract approximately, uh, including a few add-ons uh, beyond the bridge. It was a 24-month construction program that was meant to overlap uh, a little bit with the design program, which was uh, 12 months, more or less, which is all sort of fairly, looks fairly standard. Um, and the funding came from various sources, uh, US Department of Transport via um, Florida Department of Transport, uh, the county, the city of Sweetwater, and uh, FIU itself. So uh, a, a varied, uh, a varied uh, set of um, funding there. So often with, uh, with this sort of failure, you start to ask questions about uh, design and construction assurance. So this, uh, this is to try and address that, so to sort of see what they actually uh, had in place. Uh, the partial federal funding uh, via the Florida Department of Transport meant that they had to have an independent peer reviewer on board, um, even if it was a private, uh, um, a, a private project. So with the independent peer review, I, I read the requirements of that, and it's pretty much akin to uh, the BD2 Category 3 check. So a proper check was required. And FIG engaged Louis Berger to, to, to do this. Uh, the construction engineering and inspection uh, contract that uh, I mentioned earlier was on behalf of the client, contract administration, site monitoring, materials inspection, um, a, 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 proper, uh, a proper site supervision role, which we're, we're having a bit less of in the UK at the moment, I would say. 
Um, and that was awarded to, uh, uh, awarded to Bolton Perez and Associates by FIU. So going into a bit of a description of the structure, um, we never got it to look like this, but uh, this is the, the structure as it's meant to look in its finished state. So a cable stayed uh, truss footbridge uh, with, a cup with two spans, and it's to connect uh, the university campus to the south, which is uh, uh, that side of the, I've got a pointer here actually. So the university campus is that side, and this side you've got uh, a mainly residential area to, to, to the north. The notes on, uh, in, this, uh, in this extract, it was a design and build technical proposal, the, the notes in this extract actually state that the stays are only there to, to, um, to stiffen the deck and is for better dynamic behaviour under, under pedestrian loads. So not, not really structural. Uh, yeah. So this is what it was, uh, again, what it was meant to look like in its, uh, in its final state uh, over the road and the canal there. And uh, part of the documents that I found uh, on the Florida Department of Transport uh, uh, website were all the detailed design drawings. So we can, have, we can actually see what they, what they intended. So you can see here that it's, a, it's the two-span bridge uh, um, the, with a 50-meter span over the road, 53 ex uh, to be exact, and a 30-meter span uh, over the canal. So it's a, you can see it's a, a truss concrete truss footbridge. It's meant to be continuous here. And uh, as I said, there's a, there's, a, there's a slight sort of visual, uh, um, visual thing here where they've tried to make the, uh, the, uh, the, the diagonals look like continuations of the, uh, of, of the stays, which is uh, it's just visual rather than required, I think. So moving on. This is a cross-section of the structure. It's what they call the, an I-beam, an a modified I-beam. You'll see why. You've got, uh, um, the, there's a canopy up here, which is five foot, uh, five, sorry, not five foot wide, five meters wide. And uh, the deck, the walkway down here is, uh, is 10 meters wide. And, uh, and, the, and here, this is, uh, this is about uh, a metre, a bit less than a metre. So the, the deck itself is about 600 millimetres uh, deep here, at its deepest point. Uh, everything is post-tensioned. Uh, this is post, the, the canopy is post-tensioned longitudinally. The walkway deck is also post-tensioned. And the diagonals, uh, where they're, uh, they're expected to be in tension, are also post-tensioned. Uh, the, the, top, the top and bottom cord are post-tensioned with tendons, uh, stranded tendons, and, uh, um, and the diagonal members with, uh, with pre-stressing bars. Construction sequence. Uh, the construction sequence drawings show the intention to cast the main span, uh, the main span off-site uh, to be brought in by uh, SPMTs uh, into its final position. So uh, having a, a truss over the, the road simply supported in, in, in a temporary state. This, is, uh, this would, was going to be followed by uh, casting the, uh, the backspan in situ, post-tensioning it, uh, and, then, and then solidifying the two with a stitch and post-tensioning uh, through the two to make them continuous. Unfortunately, we, didn't, we never got to stage four, if you can see it there. Um, yeah, so th these are the, uh, the, 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 the subsequent stages, uh, getting, getting the, uh, the pylon up and then adding the, uh, the passive uh, steel hollow, uh, hollow section stays um, just there for stiffness and, and appearance, I think. So I've got, I extracted this from the design and build technical proposal just to give you a, a, a sense of uh, where, where it all is. Uh, um, this, uh, this is uh, north and that's south on that side, so the university is on this side, the uh, residential area here. Uh, Miami city center is to the east this way, and, uh, and this, this uh, purple band here is, is the structure itself. The, the blue, dark blue rectangle is the casting yard where they intend to precast it before moving it into place uh, using the, uh, the SPMTs. 
So the preparation for the bridge move uh, occurred between 1st of March and 9th of March 2018. I don't have many pictures in the, uh, in the casting yard because there just weren't many available uh, um, publicly. So we're going straight, straight into the, the general preparations for the move. So you can see uh, the completed span in the casting yard uh, here, and you can see sort of the, um, the preparations for the SPMTs uh, steel plating on the ground. Uh, there. You can also see down here post-tensioning anchorages for the, for the tendons. Uh, and some starter bars for the future pylon. So from the west again, you can see the, uh, the SPMT is practically ready to be moved into place now uh, and uh, soon, soon to, to move the, uh, the, the span into its final position. 10th of March 2018, they were ready for the bridge move and uh, so we have it here, and I have, uh, hopefully the technology won't let me down, we have a bit of a time lapse here. So you see they started in the early hours of the morning, moved it round onto the road, daybreak, and they're just adjusting <coughs> the height now to bring it in above the supports and then lowering it down. Now the, the, the last few works you can see uh, on top of the canopy is that they're de-stressing uh, they're de-stressing bars that are in the uh, in the diagonals. Now the significance of that will become clear a little bit later. So we'll, just, we'll come back to that. <coughs> so uh, just one uh, one view. That's just the the, com the confirmation that they were working on the canopy after it was in in place to de-stress to de-stress bars. You can see the SPMTs had already been retracted, and uh, the the structure is is on its final supports. So on to the fateful day, Thursday 15th of March at about 1.47 p.m. Now, I'm just showing another picture. Now, this is not at the same time. This is seconds before the collapse. They're again working on the, uh, on the canopy, and this time they're not de-stressing. They are re-stressing uh, diagonal bars in, uh, in, in, that last, uh, in that last diagonal. Um, again, you'll see the significance of that later. So again, I have a video of this, and some of you will probably have seen this already. It's uh, available online. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side, they're working on the top, and then that, <coughs> which is a shock every time I see it now. Um, So the day of the collapse, as I said, Thursday 15th of March, uh, 1.47 uh, p.m. Uh, only two of the traffic loads were closed at the time to allow for the work that was being carried out on, on, the, on, on the canopy. Uh, eight vehicles uh, stopped below the bridge uh, and they were fully or partially crushed. Uh, one bridge worker and five vehicle occupants died. Four bridge workers and four other people were injured, and some of them uh, very critically. Um, the NTSB urgently sent a team to investigate. So the National Transportation Safety Board is there to investigate any transport-related uh, um, incidents, and uh, this is what they do. Is they started with uh, aviation initially, and now they, they, they work across all, um, across all transport-related uh, issues. So a picture of the bridge uh, in its collapsed state. Uh, what's uh, clear to see is uh, the, uh, the southern end of the span basically followed the rest of the span. It's, it's practically intact. So it was the rest of the span that brought it down. And uh, the, 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 the serious damage you can see at this end. And, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, most of the reports are, are very clear that it all uh, started at this end, at the north end. So one more view of the wreckage where you, you can see how the cars were completely, well, in one case, completely flattened. So it was quite, uh, quite harrowing. This is a detail at the, at the northern end. Uh, you can see the, the, the remains of the end of the, uh, of, of the final diagonal here, and that's the final vertical. The, um, the walkway is, is laying on the ground down here, basically.
So onto the NTSB investigations. Uh, so these were the first people uh, on site, and st uh, they started uh, um, they started looking through the wreckage, and uh, within within sort of a week, they'd already come up with a preliminary report. So a bit of background on the NTSB. They're an independent agency, and they're and they they're brought in for the investigation of anything transport related as I. Uh, accidents that are transport related, as I mentioned earlier. They don't have regulatory or enforcement powers. Uh, they, they only analyze factual information and they determine probable causes of an accident. Um, they're, they're, what, they, what their findings cannot be entered as evidence in a court of law. And uh, generally what they, what they produce is public and it's aimed at improving the industry safety record. So it's, it's a very much an independent body. So they, they produced uh, three reports uh, so far, and so the preliminary report and two investigative uh, updates. So the prelim, pre preliminary report uh, conf confirms some of the things that we saw in the photos earlier, that they de-stressed bars in the, in the, in the final diagonals uh, once the bridge was in its final position, and that they restressed bars in uh, the diagonal at the side that was, uh, uh, was allegedly the, the start of the failure, and, and that was just before the bridge collapsed. They also noted uh, the emergence of some, uh, some cracks in the region of that northern, uh, northern diagonal, uh, of which we have some photos. These were, these were in their preliminary report. So these cracks appeared uh, in the casting yard once the bridge was on its end support, so mimicking its, uh, its, uh, its temporary position in, the, in its final location. So it's just supported at the ends. And so these, these cracks uh, appeared, so diagonal cracks, so that's, uh, that's member 11, and that's the deck down there. And uh, here there's the deck and there's some diagonal cracks here. So those were the initial cracks that they noted. Now this is just something I, I added just to, to, to confirm that uh, the intention on their drawings, their detailed design drawings, so this is the, this is the northern end uh, with, uh, with the pre-stressing bars in there. There was an intention to, uh, to de-stress these bars. The reason they were stressed in the first place is because the SPMTs were inbound carrying, uh, carrying the deck, not carrying it at the ends. So those final panels of the truss were, uh, the, the, the diagonals would be in tension. So they, they needed to be uh, pre-stressed. Uh, pre but once it's on its final supports, it's back in compression. So the idea was, let's de-stress it at that point, which all seems logical. So there you can actually see, um, this is in the wreckage, you can, you can see the, the jack that's on the end of the bar, uh, so, uh, so we, we know that they were doing something to that, to that bar at the time of collapse. So investigated uh, update number one, uh, so there are no real material issues, they carried out some tests on the materials, but the most interesting part were the additional photos that they that, that unearthed, which were a little bit more worrying in terms of cracking. So. Um, this is the final ver the vertical at the north, so it's, uh, so it's at that location there, and uh, this is the, the deck uh, just uh, adjacent to it. So on one side it's like this, and on the other side it's like that. So it, it very much looks like a V-shape being pushed out of the end of the, uh, out of the, end of the deck. So uh, almost just about as worrying and just adding to the overall uh, issue. The, these are the cracks that were visible on the, this is the final diagonal 11 and the vertical member 12. And here you've got the diagonal 11 again and, and you see this, the size of the cracks uh, and you, you can tell from that obviously it gives you a, gives you a feel for it. That it, it does seem to suggest that there's a bit of movement occurring which, uh, which would worry most of us. Um, so there was another update in November last year and in this update they, they came to some preliminary conclusions and uh, so they concluded that design errors were made uh, at the node where no member 11 
meets the deck and that uh, the, the cracks that, uh, that, that were visible were consistent with the design errors. So that was, uh, uh, that was the, 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 their main conclusion. But they haven't, there's still a final report to come in, uh, I believe it's three or four months' time. So, but that's the first conclusion. Um, so moving on from that, there, is, there has been subsequent information since uh, that, that last report. So, so things went very quiet for four or five months. Uh, a lot of things have been happening. There's, uh, there's, there've been, uh, th th there's a lot of sort of uh, court proceedings ongoing uh, because the victims and what have you have, have taken people to court. And, uh, and uh, that, that's been going on in the background. But a few months ago, we, we got a, few, a, a little bit more information uh, Florida Department of Transport uploaded some more documents. They, they seem to be trying to project the impression of only being minimally involved, which is maybe a byproduct of the whole process being so public. They're trying to protect their image. Um, but this is where the, um, the, 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 news, uh, the, the, the news people have become uh, quite useful because they, they've dug up some interesting information um, where they, they, they've actually unearthed review comments from the Florida Department of Transport, uh, raising concerns about the concept uh, well before detailed design drawings were ever produced. Um, beyond, uh, beyond those bits of information, we just had the Occupational Safety and Health Administration report uh, two days ago, and uh, we'll go through a few of those, uh, uh, those uh, elements now. So from uh, Florida Department of Transport, they, they, they published these minutes of meetings on the day of the collapse, uh, the, the, on the morning of the collapse. And uh, there was a discussion on the cause of the cracking and presentation of further justification from FIG that the structure was in no imminent danger. Now, uh, I didn't have time to put in all the slides, but there, there are photographs of, the, uh, of uh, FIG's uh, presentation. So there's no ambiguity that they, that they were saying that it's, uh, that, that it's safe. They carried out all sorts of analyses, uh, 3D uh, brick element uh, um, uh, analysis, and uh, along with strut and tie, all sorts of analyses. And they said, we can't explain the cracking, we think it's okay, just, uh, just grout it up, was, was their, was their um, conclusion. Um, one of the things that was mentioned in the minutes of meeting, which is a red flag generally to all or any structural engineers, is that the cracks <laughs> increase in length. I think normally you'd say width, but w if it's increasing, it's increasing. So we, you know, it's, it's one of the things you always ask, I would say. But, um, uh, so what FIG proposed was additional shimming at the pier directly below the truss center line. So just to, to pick up the, the vertical load directly. Initially they had uh, shims uh, uh, outbound from the, the central line of the, of the truss. So they just, put a, they just required a shim to be put in the middle to, to, to take the load directly. Um, and then uh, the other thing that they, that they um, recommended was restressing of the PT bars in member 11. Overall, the, the meeting does suggest that people were concerned. It wasn't just completely ignored, that the designer has uh, put their minds at, at, at rest somewhat by saying, we've done everything, we think it's fine. This is an interesting thing. This is from uh, the, uh, the review that FDOT carried out, 30% uh, um, design submission. And just the interesting thing is that they've shown the cracks that they expect to see in the design, and they're expect and they're saying, uh, we, we, you know, the designer should do something about these. So um, the question is, was it a prescient review comment? Uh, I don't know why it wasn't followed up, but uh, it was never. Uh, you can see there's no nothing has changed in the concept. This is something that was uh, in the NBC six investigation. I am not 100% sure of that this is uh, that, that this is correct, but there hasn't been any uh, any denial of this from Florida Department of Transport. Uh, these are review drawings of on the detailed design drawings, and uh, you can see at every one of the end nodes, uh, the reviewer is from the Florida Department of Transport is suggesting that they beef up those sections. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't vouch for this 100%, but uh, I do know that FDOT haven't, haven't denied this so far. 
So last but not least, uh, the OSHA reports, 11th of June 2019, two days ago. Uh, so it's a fairly damning uh, conclusion. FIG bridge engineers failed to recognize that the bridge was in danger of collapsing hours before the collapse. The bridge has structural design deficiencies that contributed to the collapse. Uh, they should have closed the, 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 the bridge to traffic immediately on viewing the, 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 the cracks until final evaluations had been carried out. They said that if, you're, if you've got remedial uh, action on something that's quite serious, it should be checked before it's, uh, imp uh, before it's implemented, especially over live traffic. Um, they also brought up the fact that Louis Berger were only contracted to check the finished structure, not the intermediate stages. And the uh, last thing they mentioned was both uh, Bolton Perez and Associates and Manila Construction Management failed to exercise their own independent professional judgment. So quite a damning, uh, quite a damning set of conclusions. Just a, a, a photo for interest. This is the end of the deck that was sort of salvaged, and, you, and it's in a, in a construction yard somewhere. Uh, this, this is the area where the, um, the diagonal was uh, attached, and it's just completely sheared off and taken a, a wedge out of the back of the, um, of the structure. One other thing that uh, they, they, they touched on was why did it happen at the north and not at the south? So you can see the, um, you can actually see the, the, the differences in the dimensions here. Everything is a lot smaller on the south compared to the north. The angle of that strut is, is such that the, the length to transfer shear was much bigger. So that, that's potentially one of the contributing uh, um, elements. And, and then when you see some of the detailing, this is the, this is the vertical here. So we're looking down at the deck where, where the cracks were, the diagonal cracks. And you see 200 millimeter diameter ducts cast into the concrete in a critical location where they need to transfer shear to go laterally into the, into the deck. So that, that clearly would not have helped. Um, so I think the only thing I can say is what can we learn from this? Uh, Looking at uh, the OSHA, OSHA's conclusions, uh, independent checking uh, when it's required for a structure should include every critical stage, shouldn't ignore the construction stages. Um, these were sort of, these are more sort of for discussion really, some of the other ones. Do we need education in pre-collapse behavior? Very clearly they, they ignored the, uh, the signs I, uh, from what, what we can see and what uh, the OSHA report has concluded, they ignored the signs. So do we need some sort of education in what happens to a structure before it collapses? Um, do we need another question in our, in our design process? What are the ways in this structure, this structure could fail? This is something we may ask during assessment, but do we ask it during design? Um, and are we becoming too specialized? As I said, builders, uh, builders build, supervisors supervise, but is it preventing them from exercising their own independent professional judgment? 